What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Saturdays in the SEC, episode 133, back for a full week seven recap. I mean, an absolute insane weekend uh, worth of games in, in the SEC and nationally. Um, I think, speaking for both of us here and probably everyone listening, that was one of the most exciting nightcaps of games I can remember in, in quite some time. I, I had all the devices going at my disposal. I know you had your YouTube TV multi-view uh, to, to capacity there. So, man, it, it was a lot of fun Saturday. Um, I mean, we got an absolute another loaded slate here for week eight. So, we're we're going to jump right into it. We got a lot to, lot to get into tonight. And we're going to start with the 11 a.m. game in Tuscaloosa, uh, Alabama and South Carolina. Uh, ends up going down to the absolute wire. Uh, Alabama ends up pulling it out 27-25, uh, holding – Holding on at the very end, uh, South Carolina gets an onside kick and and has a shot to go win it with a field goal. Uh, the North Sellers and ends up getting picked off in the end zone and and uh, and the tie were able to 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 hang on. I mean, obviously a lot of a lot of nervousness I think with the fan base right now. You know, you the last the way the last you know ten quarters have went. You know, had a tough second half against Georgia, but but were able to win that game. Go on the road, lose to Vandy. Uh, looking the way you did defensively, obviously, is a anytime's a cause for concern. And then, um, you know, not really being able to finish the way you want to against South Carolina. You know, up fourteen nothing before halftime, give up a big fourth and nine. Uh, you know, about a forty or fifty yard bomb for a touchdown. Um, and then, you know, the ensuing kickoff, getting a personal foul penalty, backing you up half the distance to the goal. Um, then getting a getting a safety for for intentional grounding in the end zone, getting sacked. Um, then throwing an interception, you know. So I feel like going into half, you know, to that last two minutes, Alabama was completely in control of the game. Obviously, gave South Carolina really spotted them five points, basically going into going into half. Um, gave South Carolina all the momentum going in the locker room, and South Carolina puts one of those, you know. 15, 16 play drives that teams have been doing lately against Alabama's defense go up midway through the third quarter. You know, took I believe eight or nine minutes out of the third quarter on that opening drive, and were able to go score. And um, you know, so it was one of those sloppy games. You know, multiple turnovers on both sides. I mean, a couple times the defense made some nice plays, and you had a couple that were just thrown right to them, or, you know, we were talking about earlier Lenore Sellers and the, the missed, you know, exchange and the fumble when South Carolina had the lead, and that kind of gave Alabama a little bit of momentum back, and they were able to take the lead, and um, thought at the end of the game as well, um, you know, the kind of the big play everybody's talking about, you know, Alabama converting on fourth down, but not falling down short of the end zone, that would have you know, you could have nailed the game out at that point and it never would have came to an onside kick or them getting that game time drive and just a lot of, you know, missed execution, just missed situational awareness, I feel like. Um, obviously happy, you know, happy they got the win, but um, at the same time, you just want to see, you just want to see yourself be able to close games out a little better, close halves out better because that is so critical to the football game you know, taking care of those last few minutes of each half and in the game scenarios. And I mean, give South Carolina a lot of credit though. I thought they came in. They're they're man, they're edge rushers. We talked a lot about them. They are absolute problems. You know, Dylan Stewart, the true freshman, uh, has obviously got a lot of praise and deservingly so, but Kyle Kennard, man, the dude is an absolute problem yeah. coming off the edge. I mean, Alabama had no answer for him for most of this game. Um, the leading SEC sack leader coming in and, and certainly coming out of the game. Um, I mean, that's about that's about as good of uh, edge rushers as you're going to see anywhere in the country, what South Carolina can throw at you. So I expected that coming into the game. I knew that was going to be a big challenge, a big matchup with Alabama's offensive line, their their D-line. And, um, you know, they, they won a lot of that battle, you know, I think getting some pressure on Jalen Milrow, and I think you saw a few, you know, kind of uncharacteristic mistakes from what we've seen from him this year. And um, But I want to give them credit. I mean, um, you know, they they had a great 
you know, good game plan. They executed pretty well. Obviously had some, you know, some blunders that that cost them a chance to to really win it at the end. Alabama kind of had their own blunders as well. It was a it was an ugly game, but Alabama was able to come out on top and obviously got a huge showdown this week with Tennessee. Absolutely. You know, was was surprised by South Carolina. Honestly, didn't didn't expect them to give them much of a game. Uh especially coming off the loss to Vandy. I thought Alabama would come out and just be honestly just, just dominant. Um, but you know, it just goes to show you how much parity there is in, in college football, especially in the SEC right now. Uh, I mean, the the bottom eight, eight through 14, eight through 16, whatever, that's usually no chance that they're in games and they're blown out by the second half is they're, they're just as close to four through seven that, than they've ever been, uh, I believe. I mean, this is just showing you, obviously, this season so far, uh, all the great things we've seen. We got another great weekend next weekend. But yeah, the Alabama South Carolina game, um, the the final drive by South Carolina to even put it up or to, to give them a possession or a chance to go into overtime, uh, amazing. But I thought that South Carolina, obviously they had some turnovers and Bama forced some turnovers, but the the fumble after the safety, uh, they had the you know, their intentional grounding in the end zone. They had the the safety. They got the ball back, so they took a possession from Alabama, and then they fumbled the handoff, give it right back to Alabama, short field. Alabama uh, obviously ends up scoring some points off of that. So not being able to ex- or execute when they had their chances to really take over the game. I believe they were up at that point by five, uh, so they really could have taken over the game right there. Or no, 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 that, they were down they were down four or five, whatever it was at the time. But uh, I, I thought that was a big part, too, or, or a, bit, a big dagger to them. I know it was early. Uh, but they also had some interceptions late in the game. Uh, Lenore Sellers fumbled early in the game on a on a sack. I'm not sure what he was trying to do, but they they really gave Alabama every opportunity to win this game, along with Alabama also giving them opportunities to win this game because, like you said, pretty much early, Bama had complete control. They gave them some chances, and South Carolina gave them right back. So it's just, you can't do that if you want to win on the road in the SEC. It's just uh, – that that's not a recipe for success. Um, I, I also want to talk about the uh, obviously Texas Oklahoma game. Man, Red River rivalry did not compare to last year whatsoever. Man, at all, not even close. Texas comes in and early on, the first few drives it looked a lot like last year. There was a, a Quinn Ewers threw an interception. It was first game back for a while, threw an interception, and then I'm that they couldn't they stalled out. I'm like, uh oh. Uh oh, this is my happen again. And then nod. they finally found their groove and they were way too much for Oklahoma. Oklahoma still without their starting five wide receivers, missing some guys on the defensive side of the ball, too. So they were, I mean, early on they, they played good, but they they couldn't hang with them. And then Texas got in their their ways where they trapped them with their deep shots and and they dominated, man. I mean, just look look really, really good, like the number one team in the nation, like everyone expected them to look. After the fourth, fifth drive, it was it was cruise control for Texas and I mean, they really – I wish there was more to cover on this game, but Texas just dominated from first step to the to the last. Yeah, I mean, I almost texted you in the first quarter. I was like, man, you know, Oklahoma, they're getting their kind of game, you know, early. And I think that lasted for, you know, most of the first quarter. I mean, it's 3 nothing at the end of the first quarter. And, you know, Texas exploded there in the second quarter, uh, you know, 21-3 to three at half. And kind of like you said, uh, Oklahoma just – they just don't have any offense right now. I mean, their offensive line struggling. I mean, it's a tough scenario for Michael Hawkins to be in right now. I mean, he's a obviously a very young quarterback. Um, you know, and just doesn't really have the the complement of pieces that he that he needs around him right now. Um, just don't think they've been great either from a schematic standpoint, you know, going, you know, from Jeff Levy last year. Just hasn't been near the same offense that you would want even early in the year when they were healthier with Jackson Arnold. It was just – it was a struggle. Uh, it's just been that way all year. And now with so many injuries, it's just – there's just not much chance for them. Um, you know, they they really have to benefit with their defense, give them a short field. And Texas, man, is just way too good, way too fundamentally sound to, to let that happen. As you said, um, kept getting stops with their defense. Um and then, obviously, you know, we know what Texas is offensively. Um, 
I mean, it's the number one defense in the country right now. I mean, they have been outstanding. I mean, this is um, definitely feels like the you know the most complete team in the country. And I know they haven't really, from a strength of schedule standpoint, haven't really been tested yet. I mean, they played you know Oklahoma, they played Mississippi State two weeks ago. What they did, the, what they did to Mississippi State, what Mississippi State did to Georgia. Not that they beat them, but the way they played against them, I mean, it's completely different. And you can't compare week to week. I get that. It's different week to week. But the what you compare those two games against the same opponent, it was completely – not no struggle whatsoever. Really no struggle for Georgia till late. They got sloppy, had some turnovers, but we'll get to that. But, like, Texas, it was, you know, with their backup quarterback, like it was nothing. And with Carson Beck, who was supposed to be a Heisman front runner, they struggled a little bit late. Yeah. And, I mean, you look at their non-conference schedule, obviously Michigan isn't what, you know, they they have been in the past and obviously a, a whole new regime up there for them. So, I mean, obviously we're going to find out a lot this week playing Georgia. You're really going to find out for the first time. Like, I, I pretty much know how good Texas is. Like, I, I know this is one of the best teams in the country. I'm not doubting that one bit. They're, they're very solid on both sides of the ball. But, yeah, it just felt like with Oklahoma so limited offensively, there was just never really a chance for them in this game after the first, you know, first quarter, really. Uh, once Texas kind of turned it on the second quarter, at, that was all she wrote. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just a dominant – and, you know, you just feel like, too, you know, Texas is – there's more in the tank, but they're not having a – they're not really having to go to it right now. You know, they're, they're just being so complimentary on both sides of the ball. It's like – could they have beat them by more? Yeah, but it's like they they didn't need to do more than what they were doing. Like they're not, you know, they're not trying to beat everybody seventy to three. Like they're they're just focused on playing complimentary football, doing doing what they do. And you know, it just feels like they're not they're not reaching, they're not pressing for everything. They're just kind of letting everything come to them. And um, they're just playing a really good brand of football right now. They're really really fun to watch and. Getting Quinn Ewers back, obviously thought he had a you know really nice game off of injury, and you know get, that bye week give gave him a little bit of extra time too. And it's nice when you have this kind of roster and a backup that's as good as Arch Manning to not have to rush him back. You were able to take your time with him, make sure he's a hundred percent. And now you know, kind of getting his feet back under him before he had to play Georgia. I thought that was huge and. Yeah, all in all, just a really good team win for Texas. Here. I got a question for you. So, Steve Sarkeesian, about, what, eight, nine years ago, was the head head man at USC, correct? Might not have been that long ago, but he was the head man at USC. They expected mm-hmm. him – they gave him the keys to the kingdom, expected him to do what he's done at Texas at USC. Yes, there were some off-the-field issues. I get it, whatever. Do you think it played more in the fact of his off-the-field issues, or do you think it plays more in the fact of it's so much easier to recruit football-wise to Texas than it is USC – uh, historically, you know, those two were in our childhood, those were the two programs. So, do you think yeah. it was more as off the field issues? Do you think it was just it's Texas, it's so much, easier, especially now with the NIL, it's all legal? What's your opinion on that? I mean, honestly, I think it, I think a little bit of both from the standpoint of, you know, he had the off the field issues. Obviously, he's in a much better place personally yeah. Yeah. now as well, professionally. I just think. Those experience and and that's the thing is too. We always think of players developing, and you know, a player from freshman to sophomore, how they develop through their career. Well, coaches have to develop too. You know, right. he was a younger head coach at the time. I mean, look look at like Lane Kiffin. Look right. at all the trials he's went through, and how it's kind of developed him. And now he's a totally different coach than what he was early in his career. I think a similar thing with Sark. I think obviously he's in a much better place you know, personally off the field. And then as a coach, I just think he learned a lot through those experiences. Obviously, coming to Alabama and learning under Nick Saban was a huge part of that, learning how to run a, a total program, you know, developing more as a coach. And um, so I think when this opportunity came around, he was much more ready now than he was, you know, like you said, eight, nine, ten years ago when he was at USC and at Washington. Um so I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think just personally him being in a better place, but at the same time he's, you know, coaches, like I said, young head coaches, like you're seeing it right now with Dan Lanning. I mean, you know, you know, it, it takes time as a young, you know, first time thing. You learn things as the years go on and how to do things a little bit differently, how to 
you know, Nick Saban said it perfectly on game day too. He said, you know, he was like, I was a, I was a transactional coach early in my career. He said, when I started turning into a transformational leader and uh, he's like, it changed my total coaching career, you know, of, of how I, how I did things, how I handled the team, you know, how, how I handled each individual players and in program as a whole, I think, Mainly with Sark, I just think he's developed so much through those trials, through those, you know, through some of the mistakes he made. And, um, you know, I was pretty confident when he got the Texas job. I thought he would do a really good job. Like, I thought he was a much different coach than he was the first go around. And I think you're you're seeing that come to fruition. And he's doing, you know, as good as anybody, you know, could have hoped for. And I, I think he's in a perfect spot for him now. And, um, you know, many coaches have went to – Texas as as easy as it is to recruit there. There's so many coaches before him that's come in and failed and failed epically. And I think he's came in and did a great job. And I think that development's a big, you know, big reason why. Yeah, I could have said it better myself. Uh we we alluded to it earlier, but Georgia takes on Mississippi State. And early on it was they were it was a route. I mean, at one point it was 34 to 10 uh, or 37 to 10 or 27 to 10, something along those lines. They were up big. Uh and then there was a turnover. After ha- really first half, flawless. Second half, absolutely sloppy. Sloppy as all get out. They were getting absolutely burnt post on the defensive side of the ball multiple times. I mean, they were hitting them deep, burning them way past the safeties twice. I know one for a touchdown, one for a big game that was followed by a touchdown. Uh, and then there was an interception early. There was an interception late. Carson Beck has not looked like the same quarterback that we saw last year. Defensively, they, they were okay for the most part. They like I said, they got they got burnt bacon a couple of times. Uh, but I mean, this is not the Georgia team we're used to seeing uh in week seven. Uh this is the Georgia team we've we're accustomed to seeing week two and three, like we did against Kentucky and, and the likes, but not against in week seven, you know, middle of your conference schedule. I I don't think I was super high on Georgia this year coming in. I believe I had them two in the preseason rankings. I have to go back and look, but I believe I had them two. I and I'm not saying they're bad. Obviously, they they still could have a chance to to make the playoffs. But I there's a lot of question marks around this Georgia team. They've got one of the toughest schedules I've ever seen. They got to go on the road to a bunch of different top top ten opponents. They got to don't they have to travel to Texas and to Alabama? Am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah, two. They were obviously at Alabama, at Texas. They got to go to at Ole Miss later, whose season at this and point. They host you know, Tennessee, or do they play Tennessee this year? They play Tennessee. It's at home, but they so, yeah, okay. they so got they Tennessee. Still have so to play a, Tennessee. So it's a brutal schedule. There's 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 another loss coming. I, I feel I feel like there's another loss coming for them and Alabama both. I think there's a loss coming for Texas somewhere along the way. It's going to be so hard, like we've talked about a million times, to stay perfect. But this Georgia team, there's a lot more question marks around them than I've had around them uh, in quite some time. Again, I still think that they're going to be there in the discussion in the end. But there's a chance that they could have three losses at the end of the year just because of where these games are being played uh, and, and how late in the season they're being played. And, and, and I don't see Georgia getting any better. I see them staying about the same. Um, and, and that's a – that's a disaster waiting to happen in this part uh, of the schedule here in the, in the, in the meteor schedule at the end of October and going into November. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell you what's just fascinating about this season. You know, we've talked a lot about, and I just think each week that goes by, we're seeing it more and more. Like I can't remember a time where the best team in the SEC and the worst team, that that gap was so close as it is now. I mean, you look at just some of the results we've gotten this year, but, you know, Vandy beating Alabama, you know, Mississippi State playing right there with Georgia for, you know, giving them a much tougher game than anybody would have thought. Um, you know, Arkansas beating Tennessee, you know, Florida almost beating Tennessee. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, a lot of missed opportunities there. I mean, you just look at the results week after week and, I mean, there there are no – there are really no easy teams. Like, I mean, Mississippi State, I guess, is technically the worst team in the SEC. And, and you've seen them. Like, they played Texas tough for a little, little while. Um, you know, played Georgia tough. Like, you know, v, you know, Vandy's much better than everybody expected. I mean, South Carolina's a tough out. 
you've seen Kentucky be a tough out, you know, just ask Ole Miss. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's I've never seen that gap as small as it is right now. And I think some of these teams, you know, I mentioned Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, not hitting on all cylinders right now. And I think, obviously, part of that is just execution, but part of that is just, like, the gap has is, is never been smaller. So I think there, there, there's a less margin for error than it's ever been or that I can ever remember. I think um, you're 100 right. Recent times. So yeah. um, I, th- I think it's a combination of, of some of those things. I, 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 th- I think all three of those are good football teams. I don't think they're elite teams. I think they're good teams, though. And good teams, good teams have rough stretches. And they also have good, you know, great stretches at times. That's, you know, the great teams are – really good all year or pretty much most of the year. You know, good teams, like I said, like Alabama did, first half against Georgia, look like they could beat anybody on this planet. And then yeah. you look at the next 10 quarters, they've had a rough stretch. They probably got another good stretch in them somewhere. Um, you know, same for all of those teams. I think Georgia still got a stretch in them, same with Tennessee. Like, I, I don't think they're going to play – that bad the rest of the year um but you know at the same time like i said that that gap has never never been smaller so you know you don't you don't have the margin for error and you, do, you don't really get to afford to play your c game very often this year so or d game this uh, very often this year so yeah it, it, it's been it's been wild um yeah i'm super excited to see like i said very sloppy in the second half though with georgia um yeah, Carson Beck definitely hasn't looked as comfortable. And you hear a lot of people going, like, what's wrong with Georgia? Like, why are they not as good? Like, is a coaching thing? I think it's because, like, they still have really, really good players. I just don't think they're quite as good as what they've had right. over right. the last couple of years. Like, they're not bad by anything. They're they're still really, really good players. But, um, man, it's hard to keep it at that 2021-2022 Georgia level year after year after year. Like, it's nearly impossible to do that. Mm-hmm. So I think – I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I just think it kind of is what it is. Um, and like I said, I, I think there will be – you know, I think they can get back to playing better. But at the same time, like, I don't think they're an elite team. So they – you know, there's going to be some some rough stretches here and there, I think, as I highlighted with with all three of those teams. And you, you could go down the line, um, I think, Pretty much every team in the SEC has some flaws, you know, e- even some of the Not teams much. near the top. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's why it's just been so wild this year. But that Georgia-Texas game, man, I think we're going to find out a lot more about both teams here. Um, it's going to be a wild environment there in Austin Saturday night. And uh, you alluded to it earlier, Tennessee and Florida. Got to go to overtime to, to take down Florida at, at home. That's what the craziest part to me was. It wasn't at the Swamp. Early on, I mean, the first few drives, Tennessee looked really good. And then threw a pick, fumbled, st- looked sloppy. I mean, there was a bunch of sloppy play by the perennial teams in the SEC this weekend. Um, and then LSU – or, excuse me, Florida had ample chances uh, to take the lead and, and take away the game, honestly, multiple, multiple times. And they, they would turn the ball back over or they would have some penalties that hurt them or – they would lose yardage, have a sack at a bad time, whatever it may be. But they they definitely had their chances. I, I take my cap off to Billy Napier. I know that the Florida fans don't want to hear that. But from what he's done, what was expected of him and what he's done with, with the schedule that he's facing and the roster he has, I mean, hats off to him. He's fighting his ass off out there, coaching everything with everything he's got. I mean, he's, he's coaching for his job, and he knows it. Everybody knows it. Um, but I mean to play Tennessee that well, yes, there were some blunders on on Florida's side as, as well. But no one expected this to even get close to going to overtime. And early on, you know, Tennessee was putting together a nice drive, and then they just could never finish. They were they were making some mistakes defensively. They didn't look as good as as they have. Uh, I, I don't know. I just I was shocked the most this weekend by Tennessee than any other team. Yeah, I mean, really the key stat for this game for me is Florida had six red zone trips and only got 17 points out of it. I mean, they they left a lot of meat on the bone, especially in the first half. They, I mean, this game went into half, looked like a 
looked like it was an error on on the on the app or on this. Obviously, we're both watching this, but you look. This game is three nothing at half. You're getting updates three nothing at half. It's like, holy crap, this is insane. And then, man, going back and watching this, though, it's like, man, how did Florida not? How was Florida only up three to nothing, man? I mean, they yeah. they it could have been ten nothing or more very easily. Fumbled on the one yard line. I think they missed a field goal. I mean, they, they just, like I said, 17 points in six red zone trips. That's not nearly good enough. Um, I mean, they they had ample chances to really, you know, really be up double digits, you know, at halftime before. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, a very encouraging performance for Florida, but at the same time, you're like, man, those, those are the time when you're Billy Napier, you're fighting for your job, and you got to find a way you know, kind of when you had control of a lot of the game. Obviously, a really tough injury for Graham Mertz. He's out for the season, so it's it's going to be DJ Lagway's show the rest Did of the Did Achilles? Week. I never heard what it was. Is it Achilles? Yeah. It, it was what it looked like when he walked away. Yeah, it was that or a knee, some, something lower body-wise, I think. Um, yeah, it was tough tough to see, man, because he, he had been playing pretty good football. but I had it on the four screen, and I wasn't on that. Channel, so I couldn't hear what they were saying. I just saw it the way he was walking and grabbing. I thought it was Achilles, but I never heard, so I didn't know. Yeah, um, I mean, I thought too. It took once Lagway came in the game, they had a couple drives that they stalled. That he looked kind of decent. hurt him from. He looked pretty uh, decent though. Yeah, he did. He did. I mean, like I said, it. Uh, I thought he played well. I just thought it took probably a couple drives to settle That's in. Fair. They had a couple That's empty true. possessions that you know, hurt them in the second half. But as I said, they left so much on the field in the first half. Um, but, no, I, I thought he played played well, especially under the circumstances. Made a couple really nice plays on that final drive, man. I, he was stepping up in the pocket, making that throw down the field. I mean, he, I mean, he, he's the real deal. There's no doubt about it. I, he's got a very bright future ahead of him. Um, and, and as much as I hate it for Graham Burt, uh, it, it will be – um, exciting to see him get the full range the rest of the way, and I think it'll be good for his development going forward into next year. Um, but yeah, I thought uh, you know Florida's defense for the most part, but I mean played well. They had eleven guys had you know half a tackle for loss or, or more in this game. They were getting in the backfield. Um, you know, Dylan Sampson though got got going in in the second half for Tennessee. I mean, he's been been their workhorse all yeah. year. Um, he scored both their touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, I think, too, with Nico, you know, he struggled throwing the ball down the field 10-plus yards past the line of scrimmage. It's, it's been a struggle. Um, and I think you've seen it in their play calling a little bit. It's been a little bit more conservative than I think you normally, you know, would see. There were some key third downs that were kind of obvious passing downs that they just handed it off, you know. So I think just trying to – Trying to manage him as best as they can. And I mean, you can see all the tools are there mentally, physically. Like he's got it. It's just, it's going to take a little bit more time. I mean, I was very high on him coming in. I think I was set the expectations a little bit high, me and probably some other people as well. Um, but I'm not any more down on him as a player. Like I think he's a, tr- uh, a fantastic player. I think he's, I mean, got a huge future ahead of him. I just don't think. I think it's going to take a little bit more time for him to come around. Um, but obviously a huge opportunity ahead of them this week uh, with Alabama coming in. But it was, it was a game they had to have. That's why, you know, you, you couldn't – they already lost to Arkansas. You couldn't afford a loss to Florida. You know, kind of like Ole Miss couldn't afford a loss to, to Kentucky. Um but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was really impressed with Florida's fight and the product they put out there, even though they made some mistakes. For them to hang in like they did, um, those guys haven't given up. And and just like any other team in the SEC, they're they're going to be a tough out the rest of the way. I mean, we've, we've already seen it so far this year. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I do want to talk about the Ole Miss-LSU game, probably the game of the day, shaped out to be a barn-burning classic. Uh, another one that went to overtime. I mean, we had a bunch of overtime games on Saturday uh, in the SEC. And so LSU, I don't think, led at all until the last, like, 15 seconds or something along those lines. Like, they just 
hung around like that, just that sore, something stuck in your teeth, like that popcorn kernel. They were just there, just aggravating, just st sticking with it, sticking with it, sticking with it. You're right. And they defense, did not um, They did not lead in this game until they won the game. But they, yeah, they didn't have the lead in, yeah. one second this game. is insane. <laughs> love it. I, I had them to cover, so they ended up covering. I, I loved it. Uh, and so, LSU really, first half, like I said, they were just – Sticking around, they couldn't really get anything fully going. But then the defense stepped up in the second half. They forced six sacks in the game. They were all over Jackson Dart. Jackson Dart was able to use his legs and scramble some here and there, but not to the to what we're used to seeing, not to the ability he usually does, especially not as much as much as he hurt him last year with it. Uh, they were able to get to him uh, a lot more this year. Like I said, six sacks. Um, and then in the second half, man, LSU's offense they came to life. They finally found a little bit of run game. Nussmeyer was, I mean, throwing some dimes, threading some needles. On uh, the last three drives, I believe he threw two touchdown passes. So, I mean, he – he obviously, he's lived up to the hype. He's been there pretty much their constant, their only constant point all season. Uh, Kyron Lacey, phenomenal job. Uh, and you got to tip your cap to the old Miss receivers too, Caden Lee and Trey Harris. I mean, those guys are some dogs. Uh, Jackson Dart, really, he played well. I did throw an interception. Uh, that that really that 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 drive was costly uh, to the end of the game, but they were able to run it for 180 yards. Or running back uh, Ulysses Bentley uh, had 107 yards on 11 carries, uh, and then Caden Durham for LSU had 12 rushes for 37 yards, but they ran for 84 as a team. Uh, Josh Williams also had had a couple carries, and then uh, Nussmeyer took off two times that converted on third down i think he had two right yeah two rushes in the game 50, 16 yards and both of them were to convert for third down uh they really really couldn't get much pressure on him but they really weren't worried about his legs all game so the times that it mattered it, it counted he made it or times that it mattered he made it count it really reminded me of joe burrow type when he was there you, he, you would just you wouldn't think about it. you just forget that he's he, he could run and he he just push it down the field push it down the field and then You'd back everybody off, and on a third and 14, he takes off and runs for 18 yards, gets a first down, and resets the change. So that's what it reminded me of. I thought he really grew up in this game a lot. I thought he did played a phenomenal second half, keeping them in there, just keeping them a puncher's chance. Uh, and then Ole Miss, they really fell apart the last quarter and a half. I mean, yeah. we're playing really, really good football, playing really strong. Had a chance to take away with it the second game or the second half, and and – they really, really fell off and, and lost their steam. I don't, I don't really know what to pinpoint what it was, but they looked like a completely different ball club the last quarter and a half of this game. And it, it, that's not taken away from anything LSU did, but you can't deny Ole Miss just looked different. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Ole Miss. I mean, obviously LSU has a great offensive line. I thought Ole Miss would be able to get after Nussmeyer a little bit more, and it's really right the opposite. LSU's defensive yeah. line was able to get after them. Six sacks, as you mentioned. You know, Garrett Nussmeyer didn't get sacked in this game. So, um, kind of looking at this game coming in, though, I mean, this was a this was a bad spot for Ole Miss. Yeah. I mean, you they're coming off playing seven straight games. This is the second game of a back-to-back -back road stretch because they were just at South Carolina. LSU's coming off a of bye week. They played – a group of five, South Alabama, the week before the bye. So, literally, LSU could not have been more prepared for a midseason game than they were this one. Rested, prepared, you name it. This was just – this was a tough scheduling spot for Ole Miss. That's why, the, this, that's why this game's been circled for so long as, you know, you looked at Ole Miss's early season schedule, No, nobody saw them going – getting beat by Kentucky at home. But to me, this was their first real test, I thought. Right. Obviously, it ended up being their their second real test. Um, and, they, and they've unfortunately dropped both of those. But, yeah, this was a tough spot for Ole Miss, you know, just with the scheduling, you know, concerns laid out. LSU obviously had ample time to be ready for this game, was rested, prepared. I think you saw that kind of play out a little bit there at the end. You know, Nussmeyer, man, he – he kind of reminds me of this analogy. He's he's kind of like a three point shooter in basketball. He may start out zero for five, but man, he is don't keep slinging it. He is don't keep shooting it. Like he is just he's just gonna keep coming at you. 
Like, doesn't matter if things don't go his way at first. Because there was times of this game where, you know, didn't make some good plays for some things yeah, a little bit. Picks. And yeah, so I mean, there were there were some times where you're like, man, you know, probably pressing a little too hard. But it's like, man, he just kept coming back at you. That is that is what we do on the dust bus. We are going to sling that rock all over the place. In the second half, and, he looked great, dude. Yeah, the those last, last couple drives. He was dying, dude. Yeah, those last couple drives in particular, man, uh, he, he was absolutely outstanding. And, and as we highlighted earlier, thought the offensive line did a great job for him. You know, didn't rely heavily on the run. I mean, they got doubled up, as you said, rushing. But, um, but man, he just he just kept them in the game. He just kept taking his shots. Um, and like I said, I thought, I thought he was just super poised at the end of the game, uh, making the right decisions. Um and just kept coming at them and 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 the nuss bus does what the nuss bus does and that's it sling that rock around the yard and <laughs> come up big in the clutch and and uh, they didn't lead the entire night uh, until Kyron Lacey catches that ball in overtime and uh, it, that was all she wrote as you said definitely the best game of the day um, in the SEC you know it was t- it was kind of right there with that Oregon Ohio State game. Um, part of an excellent yeah. nightcap for us. Uh, but, yeah, just it's such a big game for both teams. You know, Ole Miss now has two losses, both in the SEC. LSU had the one loss to USC early, but they're still undefeated. They're 2-0 and in SEC play. I mean, everything's ahead of them still. I mean, they've got flaws just like some of the other teams we mentioned the SEC. But they're still alive. They're still swinging. Um and I tell, I tell you what, though, we'll get into previews in a little bit. I do not like this spot this week for LSU, though. Coming off this game, going to Arkansas off a bye, I, I don't like it. I, I just got a, a bad gut feeling about it. That's just it kind of the way the SEC's ready. been this year, too. So, yeah. Um, But, yeah, no, a huge win, though, overall. It was a fantastic ball game. And, yeah, I thought – Thought really at the end, I just thought LSU played better that final quarter, you know, quarter and a half you mentioned. Um, but, you know, Ole Miss had, you know, fairly good control of it, led the entire game. But I just thought LSU made the bigger plays in, in the bigger moments. Absolutely. And then Vanderbilt and Kentucky to, to finish it off from this week. Vanderbilt stays hot, man. Uh, takes down Kentucky 20 to 13. Kentucky did not look good in this game. Uh Vanderbilt's defense forced some plays, uh, created created some good opportunities for Vanderbilt on the, on the offensive side of the ball. Um, Diego Pavia did throw an interception, but he ran the ball extremely well. Uh, I mean, they're they're a complete team. I I don't care what anyone says. Them beating Alabama that's given them the the injection of confidence that they need. I think they're complete enough to make a, a decent run to the end of the year. I don't think they're going to make any of the playoffs or anything, but I think that they could potentially win nine games this year. I, I truly believe it. I was just impressed with, I mean, you know, I said last week, you know, it was a key letdown spot, and I think it just showed the maturity of them, them coming out handling their business, them not coming out flat. thought they came out, were, were really ready to play this game. Um, I mean, they would have had every reason to be flat. I mean, coming off the the biggest win in the history of the program. Um, but yeah, I, I just think it showed that maturity for them. Um, I mean, they are they're a complete football team on both sides of the ball. They're playing really, you know, comp- they're really complimentary in this game. Obviously, weren't able to move the ball the way they did the last game against Alabama, but just thought they made some gritty, some tough plays. Thought their defense was excellent in this game. Um, you know, Kentucky just really doesn't feel like they have an identity offensively. It's just kind of been a struggle all year. I mean, they they rely on, you know, kind of rolling Brock Vandegrift out, kind of using his legs and, and kind of, uh, I guess, extended RPO, if you could, just trying to get him out of the perimeter and, and, and uh, let him make plays with both his arm and his legs. But just really don't feel like they have a solid identity on that side of the ball. But – yeah, to me, just really impressive with how Vanderbilt came out ready to go in this game, prepared, because um, we've seen so many teams this year have letdown spots after after big wins and um, th- with the margins being so thin, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's easy to do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it showed a lot of maturity on, on their part, and I, I was really impressed. And like I said, I think they got a real chance to make some noise down the stretch. I mean, obviously they're already way better than anybody, I, even their biggest optimist could have thought. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to see what they can do down the stretch. I, I think it's crazy, though, with Texas' schedule. Sets up just like Alabama's did. Alabama played Georgia at home, then went at Vandy. Texas Texas plays Georgia at home this week and goes at Vandy. So Vandy's got a chance. I probably won't happen, but they've got a chance to run that script back one more time. So we'll see what happens. That'd be insane, dude. It, 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 it sets up the exact same way. So I mean, like I said, I, I don't I don't think they'll beat Texas. But they could, dude. Which it, we didn't dude, think they'd it, beat it, Alabama. It, yeah, I mean, nobody thought that had happened. I mean, I, I, crazier things have happened. So, but yeah, I, I thought that was crazy how the schedule laid out. Texas playing Georgia at home and then going at Vandy the next week. Especially if they were to beat Georgia, that would be kind of a crazy, like deja vu scenario in one season, basically. So, because they they would get the number one team coming in again. How often does that happen? You get the number one team at home twice in the same season. Like, sure, I, I don't think that's happened very often. So, I agree. Uh, and then moving into this week, Auburn and Missouri kick it off. Uh, Missouri coming off of a road trip to UMass for whatever reason. I don't know. They played in front of 17,000. They played in front of more people in their spring game than they did on Saturday. Uh they beat them handily, 45-3, to three, I believe is what the score was. But Auburn coming off a of bye week, uh, I think that this is the biggest chance Auburn has to really get a spark in their season. Coming off a of bye week, you've had two weeks to prepare for this team. Uh, you know, you should have some answers offensively of what the hell is going on and why it looks so bad and why they keep stalling and can't finish. Uh, I think Auburn's going to have some answers for themselves and for Missouri this, this week. So – I like it to be a close game. It is at Missouri. It is early in the day, so that benefits Auburn being early on the road. Um, let me go check what the line is. The line is Missouri four and a half. I'm going to be honest. The way Missouri's played and the way Auburn's played defensively, I think Auburn can keep it within that number. I don't think Auburn wins the game. I'm not saying Auburn wins the game, but I think they can keep it within that number. I just think coming off a of bye week, it can help. But I, I do think Missouri probably wins the game, if I'm being honest. Uh, let's hear your thoughts. Give me Auburn. Oh. Auburn will win this football game. Okay. I like the, I like the number. At, uh, it's come down, actually. If if you look, you know, if everybody looked 24 hours ago, it was six and a half. So there's right. been some Auburn juice come down. I feel like I honestly I, I think they win the game outright. I really I'm I'm feeling good. I, I definitely like the six and a half. Like I said, it's come down a little bit if you got it a day ago or so. Um I, I think I still like it at four and a half, honestly. I I I think coming off a of bye, I think if they can limit turn I mean <laughs> the key is limiting turnovers. They move the ball pretty well. I don't know. Just I, I don't really I guess have a great reasoning for it. I just I just feel like it's one of those spots, as you said, coming off a bye, just the way Missouri's played lately. I mean, definitely think it's a close game. But I, I don't know. I, th- I think Auburn finds a way, to be honest with you. I think um, right. I think they can have some success running the ball on them. I think you saw that with, uh, with A&M, you know, a lot. <laughs> Gash Missouri. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I would be uh, – I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, – I definitely like it within the six and a half, which is basically what it opened at. Um, but if you get a little lower, I think I still like it too, and I, I think I think they find a way to win outright, to be honest with you. And then South Carolina, Oklahoma. Oklahoma opens up – they're at home, but they open up as a – or they don't know what they open at, but right now they're sitting at a three-point favorite. I'm hammering South Carolina on that. I think South Carolina's going to win this game, especially – I haven't heard, but especially if Oklahoma's – Receivers are still out, or if they're missing three of the five or four of the five, whatever it is. I like South Carolina, man. They're playing some good football. They're confident right now. I, I think they go on the road, and I think they win. I think they beat Oklahoma outright. Money line's plus 120, uh, over under 40 and a half. I, I think South Carolina wins this game. Yeah, I, I think I agree. The, the way they've uh, 
you know, the the way they came in last year, obviously made some made some mistakes, but I feel like they've been, you know, had a tough one against Ole Miss, obviously, but I feel like most of the year they played really good football. I I think this is a low scoring, low low scoring defensive type of type of game with the, both these defenses and specifically this set of edge rushers against yeah. a suspect offensive line from Oklahoma. I think Dylan Stewart and, and Kyle Kennard can have an absolute day uh, against an offense, obviously, that's struggling with a freshman quarterback with weapons that may or may not be there. Um, with an offensive line, as I said, that's been very suspect all year. Um, I just think this is a real shot for um, for them to, to wreak some more havoc. I mean, you, you saw them do that against a, a good offensive line in Alabama who's been very good in pass protection, even better than in the run game. Um, and, and they were able to cause some confusion up front. I think they can do a similar thing here. So I, I think I'm with you. I think I like South Carolina win it very low score and very close game over under 40 and a half. So You like the under or you like the over on that? That's tough to say. I, I think – I feel like the number's pretty close. Honestly, I don't have a great feel. I do think – I just – I think points are going to be at a premium with kind of both these defenses. And um, I, I just think I, – I think I trust South Carolina's offense more right now to make a few more plays. So, yeah, I, I think I'm going to lean South Carolina in a close one, but I think it's a, a one possession, you know, kind of low scoring type of game. I think I think both, both defenses can kind of wreak a little bit of havoc in this game. All right. And then Texas A&M, Mississippi State. We don't have to spend too much time on this. No disrespect to Mississippi State, but Texas A&M is a 15-and-a-half point favorite. I like them to cover that. I really do. Um, what I've seen from them since week one, I like them to cover that big time. Connor Wigman looked really good last week in his first game back. Uh, coming off a of bye week this week, let him get a little more healthy. I like Texas A&M to win big. I was yeah, wrong I about them. I said I wasn't high on them. I said I didn't think they were that good. I was wrong. They proved me wrong. They keep proving me wrong. Uh, they're they're a lot better than I expect them to be, and I, I like them big this week. I think coming off a of bye here is huge as well. I mean, if it if it wasn't that kind of scenario, I may feel a little bit differently. Um, I know Mississippi State, you know, had a bye, you know, last week, but obviously went to Georgia. Tough game too, so they're going to be, you know, they're banged up. Yeah, a little banged up. I think. I mean, I agree with you. I think. Um, I just don't. I just don't really trust State defensively enough. Um, I mean, I, I love what I saw for Connor Wigman. I mean, if he's playing close to that level, I think they could roll here. I mean, I, I wouldn't be – I mean, I wouldn't be floored if State were to keep it, you know, around the number or something like that. But I just think A&M coming off the bye with the momentum they had and, and Connor Wigman looking the way that he did, like I said, if he's playing at that sort of level – but yeah, I, th- I think they definitely cover the spread. Uh, but man, what what a slate of games we have this week in the SEC! Yeah. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, and then followed by that, LSU and Arkansas are actually playing around the same time. Uh, I'm wrong. If that follows at six o'clock, LSU and Arkansas. LSU is a three point favorite over under fifty four and a half. Um, at Arkansas, I mean, I, I I'm with you on you think it's going to be a lot tougher test than what everybody else thinks or what everybody's expecting. All right, this Arkansas defense, man, I mean, they completely changed their defense their last game against Tennessee the week of, and it looked really good. Caused a lot of problems for Nico. Um, they had a had a bye week to come up, go against this LSU team. Defensively, T. Will is going to have them ready. Offensively is, is going to be their problem, but luckily for them, LSU's defense is still not just – you know, some world beaters are good. They're better than last year, but they're not all world or anything. So that definitely helps Arkansas out a little bit. I think the line's a little low. I'm probably not going to bet this game, but I do – I agree with you. I think Arkansas is definitely going to keep it close and give them all they, all they want. But I just think LSU is too good for them. Uh, they're finding their groove now, and they've been playing some really good football. Uh, I, I think I think LSU wins this game, but the line's a little too low for me to – to say, but I, I think it's going to be a one-score game, but LSU wins. I think, I'm gonna, as I said before, I think I'm going to roll the hogs. Okay. I think just the spot they're in here, um, coming off a of bye, being at home, 
I I agree. I do honestly think LSU is the better team. Like I, I think if they played a series, I think LSU would win. I just think in the, I think in this one game scenario though, um, like I said, I just I like the spot for Arkansas. I think it's a tough one for LSU coming off such a you know emotional win, a, a field storming win against Ole Miss, which was which was uh, hold up pause <laughs> the biggest bush league. You are LSU. LSU, you have national championships. You have SEC championships. And you rush the field against a team who has never made an SEC championship appearance. That you are you are upper echelon SEC. Teams rush the field against you. You don't rush the field against other teams, especially teams of, like Ole Miss. Yes, they're good right now, but they have never made an SEC championship game, period. And you have multiple championship SEC championship trophies and national tro- championship trophies, and you're rushing a field, that you have one loss. It should, that, that ex- it should be expected. You rush the field when you will go into the game expecting to get beat by two touchdowns. You don't rush the field when you have one loss and you're at home expecting to win. I, I'm glad they won because I have money on LSU. But, I, I mean, that was the biggest Bush League. Like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I give it was an exciting finish and all. But, yeah, it was a little, little much. Uh but I think with this spot, you know, you're you're after that old miss game, obviously a lot of focus on that coming off a of bye week. Um, you go at A and M next week. Um, you know, kind of uh, in between those two games, that's obviously gonna gonna be a critical game in the SEC where both these teams are sitting right now. I don't know, I just like the spot for Arkansas. I mean I mean, deep down I feel like LSU's the better team. Like I, I feel like they would beat them majority of the time probably. But I don't know. I just, to me, it's almost a gut feeling a little bit too, because it's just the way the the SEC's been working out this year. You know, I mean, it's just when you least expect it, this just has that feel of one of those spots you you could see it. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. It being the, it's going to be a one possession game, tight game. I think I think Taylor Green's legs can make some things out. You know, LSU's front had was great last week. But I think his legs can extend some things, and um, and and as you said, Arkansas's defense has been super duper impressive. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great, you know, great game here. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll go the Hogs to to pull pull off another top ten upset. I respect it. Uh, Vanderbilt takes on Ball State. Um, they're twenty six and a half point favorite. I like them to cover. Um, Ball State's one of the worst teams in in college football, and then Georgia Texas. All right, Texas is a four-point favorite, over under 56 and a half. I have – it's been quite some time since I've seen a Georgia money line plus anything. Georgia money line plus 155. I know I said a little bit ago that they're they're going to have some traps and they're probably going to stumble again before the season ends. I'm going to be honest, dude. I don't think it's going to be this weekend. I think they're going to be locked in. They got some of the best players in all of college football. There's no there's no overlook in this game. This is one of the games you prepare for. They're not going to look as bad as they did against Alabama in the first half ever again this season. I truly believe it. I like Georgia, man. I'm I'm probably staying away from the spread and just going straight money line. I like Georgia money. I like them to win right outright. Plus 155. Drop a little bit of coin on that. Make some. That's what I think is going to happen. Uh, I don't know. I got I got a feeling that that they ain't, they're not going to be you know tiptoeing around and 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 lackadaisical this week. They're going to be ready to go, locked in. And I think we're going to see the best Georgia team we've seen all year. Man, just think if Georgia won and then Arkansas knocked LSU off and A and M be sent alone at the top of the SEC, everybody else having at least one loss. I mean. Be honest with you, the way the season's been going, that's probably probably what'll happen. I'm kind of with you. I got that. I got that feeling. You know, like you, you just anytime Georgia's doubted, you know, it just Texas they always seem for real. They always seem to rise up. Yeah, I just I do like a lot of what I've seen from Texas. I just feel like they're gonna be so ready for this game because this is. I mean, not to disrespect who they played so far, but I feel like this is their first like big game. This is the one they've had circled, you know, really all off season to season. So I'm I'm really torn on this game. I'm gonna lean Texas with it being at home, but I don't 
I don't feel like I, I literally feels like a 50 50 coin toss to me. Cause like you said, I just, it's hard to imagine Georgia. They just don't lose two games very yeah. often at all no. recently. Um, you know, their, their backs are feeling a little bit against the wall. They haven't played the way they're capable and what kind of their standard is here in the last several weeks. I can promise you that is up in their locker room. They know that they're not that they're the underdog. But yeah. This might be the first time Georgia's been an underdog since 2018, for real. Like I don't they've been favored in every game they've played Alabama, have they not? Since Kirby's been there? Except they've, maybe the first one. They've been favored the last two for sure. Uh in 2021 they were favored as well. Yeah. So yeah, the last three I know they were. I think it's in 2020 rare. they were underdog to Alabama at on the road. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, last three they've been favored. So since 2020, this is the first time Georgia's been an underdog. I, like you said, when they're doubted, they usually rise to the occasion. I, I think Georgia wins. We'll see who wins. I mean, we, we're going. It. We're on the. We're. I'm Georgia. You're Texas. So we're going to duke it out and see what happens. Uh, and then I think one of the most intriguing games, entertainment wise, this weekend is going to be Kentucky, Florida. I mean, a lot, both three and three, really similar teams. Uh, got some athletic, talented quarterbacks. Just don't really have a whole lot of pieces around them. I think Kentucky defensively is better, especially up front. Um, I think Kentucky's going to win the game. Being at Florida definitely helps. Florida's a, a one point favorite over under 42 and a half. I think I'd probably take the under there. Uh, and it's even money, so plus 100 uh, for Kentucky money line. Uh, so, I, I like Kentucky to win. I really do. I think they're going to win. I, I just don't think Lagway is going to have a, enough answers. I think this Kentucky defensive front is good enough to, to wreak some havoc on him and, and create some confusion for him, uh, maybe a little bit of panic. And I, I think they're gonna, that's going to be the bigger point for them, and that's what's going to win them the game. I'll be honest. I think this is. I think this is the most we went against each other. I'm. I'm going Florida here at home. Okay. Uh, the only reason I. I say. I, I would have said. Uh, Kentucky probably before last week. I was really impressed with Florida's defensive line. Kind of what they were able to do against Tennessee. I know they did have some success running the ball at the end of the game, but. Um, I thought they were really able to. You know, kind of get after things up front. I mean, I was. I was impressed. That was better than kind of what I was expecting. I mean, I think the the product overall has been better than what we've expected for Florida. Um, I, I, I think their defense can can hold them down at home a little bit. Just Kentucky's been so inconsistent offensively. As I said, their identity just don't really feel like they have one. You're right. Not that Florida really does either. I mean, like you said, it's like, it's like looking at two of the same thing. They're both three and three, both that have their flaws. Um. But that's partially why I'm, I'm going to lean Florida just kind of being at home. But um, picking a lot of these games, it's not with uh, it's not with 80-plus percent confidence. These are <laughs> – we've got as many coin flip games, I feel like, as we've had in, in one weekend in, in quite some time. But it's going to be – it's going to be a fantastic weekend of football. Um, I did want to touch, too, just before we wrap up on the Oregon-Ohio State game, want to get your thoughts on – what you saw in that game, it was definitely, I thought, the most well-played game of the weekend, probably most well-played game all year. Um, I, I really came away impressed with both teams, the way they both executed uh, outside of Will Howard on the final play. But yeah. but other than that, I, I thought this game just looked like a different level of football than the rest of the games we saw this weekend, just the level of execution. Um, I mean – I, I really came away feeling just as good or better about both teams. I mean, they definitely look like, you know, top five caliber teams, exactly what the rank. They both look like surefire college football playoff teams. Kind of what, what impressed you from this game and just what were your general thoughts? Like, but quarterback play impressed me the most in this game, both of them. I mean, they looked really, really, really good. Definitely upper echelon quarterbacks in, in the college football Will Howard really, really um, surprised me. Not that I didn't think he was a good quarterback, but I didn't think he was this good of a quarterback. I mean, they played extremely well, like you said, outside of that final play. Um, it, this might be the first time in a long time that the best teams in college football right now are not SEC teams. I mean, 
Oregon and Ohio State both. I mean, one point game. Clearly, these are very even teams. But I thought Oregon defensively played out of their minds in the second half. Dan Lanning's play call to have 12, 13 guys on the field to have a runoff to uh, force them to have just one final play and not be able to get set and, and kick a field goal, all that stuff. Whatever. I thought that it was a masterful job by him, especially late in the second half. Uh, but Dylan Gabriel, man, and there was talk early in the offseason that Dylan Gabriel wanted to go play quarterback for Ohio State and ended up falling through. He ends up going to Oregon. Oregon was like his second chance or second choice, and then ends up coming back to bite Ohio State in the rear end. I think it, at the time they weren't sure if they were taking a quarterback or not. I can't remember what the full story is, but there was a time where Dylan Gabriel wanted to go play for Ohio State. Uh, so that's crazy. But Dylan Gabriel, I mean, played phenomenal. It's just so crazy seeing a left-handed quarterback. There's not many of them. Uh, so – I feel like all the left-handed quarterbacks we see, though, are just really, really good, like generational type, like Tim Tebow, uh, Tua, uh, yeah. Mike Vick. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think – I don't know that Dylan Gabriel was generational talent, but, I mean, he is he is a damn good football player. And I know he's old and he's he's had a lot of different stops. He's been in college football a while, but he looked extremely, extremely good on Saturday night. Yeah, he did. I mean, you, you, you nailed it. I mean, the quarterback play was, was outstanding thought the receiver play, you know, you yeah, look yeah. at the two duos of receivers from both these teams with Oregon, I mean, you're feeling good about going and getting Evan Stewart out of the portal, man. He had an absolute ball game. You know, you got Evan Stewart and Tess Johnson on one side for Oregon, Jeremiah Smith and Amika Abuka for Ohio State. I mean, four receivers that are going to be playing a lot on Sundays. I mean, it was just athletes all over the field. But, yeah, the quarterbacks really shine through. You know, you could see those are quarterbacks that have been veterans, been in a lot of big games. Dylan Gabriel's a fifth-year guy. Will Howard's a senior. Um, both have played a lot of football, a lot of, a lot of high, you know, high-level Power 5 football and just had great athletes all over the field. Like you said, I thought Oregon's defense, man, was, was impressive. Um, but, yeah, just thought both sides executed at a really high level. It just it felt like a – a college football playoff, you know, semifinal type of game, like a Final Four, what you would expect. And, um, you know, de definitely think these teams are, go are going to be seeing each other again there in Indianapolis in the Big Ten title game. Um, you know, Penn State still undefeated. You know, they're kind of that that third team there in the Big Ten. I think all, all three of those are probably going to be in the college football playoff. So, um, yeah, just a really high-level football game. And, it was part of a, as we mentioned earlier, an excellent nightcap. And this is kind of one of the, the games that everybody had been circling this year. Everybody was looking forward to seeing, um, you know, obviously Oregon being in the Big Ten and, and playing, um, you know, playing the Ohio State's the world. And, you know, Ohio State we're going to be just fine. They go to Penn State here in two weeks. Uh, it's going to you know, uh, going at Penn State, it's going to be a, a heck of an environment. I'm sure. I'm sure that's the wideout game. So, um, game they'll probably be there. Yeah, yeah, it's going going to be huge. Um, but yeah, I I I, I really left the game feeling feeling gr just as good about both teams. Like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, both these teams are going to be be there at the end of the year. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it, dude. Did you realize? I guess I knew this because he got hurt. But this is Dylan Gabriel's sixth year. Really? Yeah, so 20, I, I knew it was fifth or sixth. I, so I was, 2019 I was, I was freshman fifth. year, and then 2020 was a sophomore year, but they got that year back. But 2021 was really a sophomore year. He got hurt that year, so he got a medical red shirt. But 2022 was really a sophomore year, then 2023 was his junior year, and then this year's technical senior year. So he probably can have one more if he wanted to just because of all eligibility stuff in the COVID year. Oh, it's funny you mention that, too. One – I want to mention one last thing before we, before we finish up. And, you know, Cam Rising, they announced today, he's probably out indefinitely, probably yeah. out the rest of the year. He's only yeah. played three games, I think. Yeah. So he, if he wants it, he'll be eligible for a medical red shirt so he can get one more year, which will be his eighth year of college football next year if he, if he so chooses that. Do you think he does it or do you think he hangs it up? I mean, my God, he's almost 30. I honestly don't. I don't know. I mean, 
I, I guess with NIL now, he'll probably come back one more. Would do like a uh, the tight end for um, Miami. They did a game day feature on yeah. there uh, at the beginning of the year. I think what this is his eighth or ninth eighth year. year. I think yeah, yeah something. He, yeah, he, he was a year, freshman so. when I was when we were freshmen in college. Yeah, so um, so we'll see what happens. But I, I, I mean, I, I guess I would assume Cam Rising probably come back for for one last uh one last go around. But yeah, I, I I'm pretty positive he'll be eligible for a medical redshirt. So it'll be if he chooses to come back, it'll be his eighth year next year, which is that's insane, insanity. That's- Double the time you're supposed to get in college, which <laughs> is insane. But uh, yeah, when, when you mentioned that um, with Dylan Gabriel, I, I had to throw that in before we wrapped it up because I thought that was you're, you're seeing it now. The seventh, eighth, ninth years, it, it seems. It's yeah, a, it, it should be that, that that all that should about run its course now. All the COVID people should be out of there by now or about to be. So, Lord willing, there's not going to be any more thirty year olds playing college football. Yeah, but. Um, but we really just uh, want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate that. You can follow us on Twitter at Saturdays underscore SEC. Um, man, it's been a been a wild uh, season so far, especially last you know few weeks here. And I mean, we got another great one on tap this weekend, uh, becoming a theme here. Um, I, I think, like I said, it's a, it's as fun and competitive as as it's ever been. Um, it's gonna be gonna be wild to see how it shakes out down the stretch with the SEC race and the college football playoff race. Um, but yeah, just keep it locked in here. We we hope everyone has a a great week eight, and we'll see y'all back next week. Thank you, guys.